My name is Adam Golov, Marketing and Communica Communications Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, so please write your questions in the chat area as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer them all, we will make them available on our website. Next slide, please. For those of you who are not familiar with DCL, we convert and organize content to create electronic documents, populate databases, publish on the web, and basically get it ready for tomorrow's technology. Next slide, please. DCL services help you refine your document conversion strategy, identify document redundancy, extract metadata, and transform legacy and future documents for real needs today and in the future. Next slide, please. DCL serves a broad client base. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Spanning across all industries. Today, we are thrilled to introduce Ari Gross, CTO and CEO of C Visions Technologies. Dr. Gross, PhD, received a a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mathematics from John Hopkins University and a PhD in Computer Science from Columbia University. Dr. Gross has been very active in the research and development of new methods and technology in the areas of computer vision, imaging, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and real-time computing for over the past 20 years. His achievements include over 40 published papers and several patents in areas related to imaging, machine learning, and document automation. Without further ado, welcome Ari. Thanks a lot for the introduction, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we hope to make the next 30 minutes as interesting and uh, as useful to you as possible. And I think, um, Adam, correct me if wrong, we're going to have a question and answer period at the end. So. We'd love to hear from you. I'm sure that uh, some of you have questions that uh, maybe we can address today as well. So we'll start with an overview about who is C-Vision, what do we do? Uh, some of the challenges for those of you starting to get into document capture, you want to move to paperless office, but how do you make that real? <clears throat> or how do you show management that if you go paperless, there's a clear ROI as you automate various processes? We'll discuss some of that. Uh, we'll talk about technology that lets you overcome some of the challenges as you attempt to capture documents, go paperless. We'll talk about opportunities for document automation in your company, and they vary by industry. You may, have, you may be a government agency. You might be a tax department. You might be part of an accounting division. You might have some forms. Maybe you're part of a bank or financial. So within each uh, industry and across uh, various verticals, there are different document, document automation opportunities uh, that arise, <clears throat> generally where there's a clear return on investment because you're taking processes that were heavily manual and you're letting the machine take over some of that work. And we'll, we'll get into some specifics. If it's too general, you can't take it home with you. So we're going to try to get into some, some specifics and some, some client case studies we'll cover. And then conclusions and then we'll have a QA period at the end. <clears throat> a little bit about Stephen. Who are we? Um, <clears throat> a bunch of people that go bowling. We went bowling yesterday, but not really. We are, we're a technology company. Chris is laughing because he got the high score. Yes. Uh, we go bowling once in a while. But really, we enable companies that want to go paperless, achieve the paperless office, that want to have some um, automation in their document-centric processes. We help them automate those processes. Um, we're in over 100 Fortune 500. We are on the bleeding edge of what's done technologically. We've licensed back to Adobe, <clears throat> to EMC, uh, to Copac, some of the larger players because we're really on the cutting edge of what's being done in document capture. We won several global technology awards, like Red Heron, Inc. 500, 5,000 fastest growing. We provide unique solutions for the highest quality PDF for people that want to go paperless, towards the paperless office, and for document automation uh, within, again, banking, finance, tax, accounting, and really horizontally across uh, most industries. We're based in the U.S. We're right here in Queens, New York. So if you have lots of paper, <clears throat> Maybe it's in your mail room. You can't tell who's nodding when you give these. I don't mean nodding to sleep. Who's actually saying, yeah, that's us. Maybe it's in your mail room. Maybe it's your AP department. Maybe it's your former's processing. Maybe you want to route stuff to the right people within the office automatically when it comes off a fax machine. So you're dealing with some sort of captured paper 
as you attempt to go paperless or, or take some of the paper out of the workflow. But when you capture documents, that's really just the beginning of the story. It's not the end. It's the beginning. And most of us these days have a capture device in the office. <clears throat> Do you have an image runner? You can't image run. Do you have a Xerox MSP? So you've got capture devices in your office. But the question is, do we really get all the benefit that we can, or do we get most of the benefit we can from them? So when you start to capture paper, there are very large storage costs, particularly if you don't compress them at all. Um, often the documents are unsecure. So now you have captured the paper, which is nice, and you can disseminate it to people, but you want to know who gets to see it. And maybe you want to be sure it's protected. <clears throat> so you can put security around documents, but you have to worry, since they're not just one pile of paper sitting in the vault or sitting in the AP department room or sitting in your healthcare office, you have to worry about who sees them. We have document inefficiencies. For example, are they searchable? Are they web optimized? Can you get to them? <clears throat> Dirty images, sometimes capture process isn't clean. There were color files. There were color forms. Transcripts, EOBs. You, you, you scan them, capture them on your Konica Minolta to black and white, and maybe now you've got diffusion, half twenty. they become dirty images. So the right image processing methods can clean them up. So just because you capture them doesn't mean they're usable. It doesn't, certainly doesn't mean they're optimized. <clears throat> Maybe you've got slowed network bandwidth. So you take your whole, all the AP forms that come in for the day, or all the healthcare forms that come in for the day, and you scan them all. If you don't compress them, all of a sudden your whole bandwidth will get tied up with moving these, these very large images around. Also, are they searchable? We call the searchable process OCR, which is an acronym, optical character recognition. The question is, if you start to go paperless, are these documents searchable? If they're not, <clears throat> you probably can't find them when you need them. So having documents captured is the first step, an important step, towards moving paper in a seamless way, towards achieving paperless office. But you've got to overcome these technology challenges. So for smart document capture, there's certainly some best, um, best processes or best procedures that we as Fusion would recommend. <clears throat> And I'm sure that our partners at DCL would agree that these are really sort of good or best practices for being able to utilize capture documents efficiently within the organization. One thing, advanced compression. There's no reason that a captured document should be larger than an electronic one. We've shown that time and time again here at T-Vision, that essentially with the right compression, you can get any captured file <clears throat> back to the size of a natively electronically generated file. So if you're paying three megabytes per page for color capture, you could be paying 50K or 70K. If it's not compressed, you're not going to be able to take that 10-page file, which is now 30 megabytes, and send it to people you want to send it to on the web or make it an email attachment. So advanced compression is a very helpful process that we strongly recommend as part of going paperless, as part of um, using document capture effectively. Compression is really an important piece of the puzzle. How the accurate OCR is another. You want to know what's in there. Just like you want to do Google search on electronic files, you want to be able to do Google type partial queries or full string queries on your capture documents as well. To do that, you need this OCR process, optical character recognition. And essentially, they're not all created equal. Sometimes off the MSP, off your scan device itself, you can do OCR. Generally, it's not going to be as good quality as you might want. Normally, when you run on a piece of software on a server as a post process, you'll get a more accurate searchable solution. So searchability of these documents is key in making them useful. Another thing is if you have something which was secure, let's say you're a health and hospitals corporation, you're talking about somebody's health care record. If they're only in one place and they're only paper and they're in the doctor's office in a folder, <clears throat> they're somewhat secure because you can't send them all over the globe. On the other hand, if that office ever catches fire, you've got no redundancy. So the tendency you want to take health care files and financial files and be sure that they're captured so you've got them and they're mobile you can code them somewhere else and they're distributed. It's very appealing, but you've got to be sure the security is covered because now these documents could be everywhere or anywhere. <clears throat> and of course, you've got liability. So we do worry about encryption and security of these documents. So going paperless, you have to worry now that the paper documents are somewhat secure within PDF, and we recommend the PDF standard for capture paper strongly, only because we know all the other standards that are out there, and PDF is by far the best, and we'll get into why in, in in the next slide in a few minutes, but one thing is security. Once you make your documents captured, electronic, you want to be sure that you know who sees them and who doesn't see them. Image enhancement is also important. A lot of times when you capture, you got to worry about 
how clean are these documents? Are they readable? Are they readable by machine? Have they taken a color file and made it, obliterated it? So image enhancement is also an important component in what we call smart document capture. Let's talk a little bit about format. If you decide to go paperless, or you decide you're going to digitize your mailroom, or your AP department, or your forms processing, or your mortgage application center, whatever part of the company that you feel could do with a lot less paper. Maybe the branch offices, the branch offices of your bank would be a good place to start. Okay, they would advise the courier traffic. But picking the right format is relevant because there's a huge difference between JPEG, PDF, TIFF, <coughs> PNG. Each of these formats was created for a reason. But for documents, PDF seems to be by far the number one format out there. And and why is that? So we'll, we'll talk about right now some of the advantages of PDF. One thing is there's something in PDF which is sort of uh, unique to PDF called image plus hidden text, which means that you can keep the facsimile of the original document looking exactly like the original. If you need it to produce it later for in a document and trial evidentiary purposes, you have something which looks exactly like the original. But underneath that, there's a hidden text layer, which isn't displayed, but it's fully searchable. So the standard way you capture documents and the preferred way in our, in our view is it's a PDF image plus hidden text. So you've got the full image, a full text simile, and you've got the text search behind it. In addition, compression is another important component you can see here. Pre-compressed, we're paying about 7 megabytes for this page. That's just a regular JPEG with minimal 80% uh, quantization. So there's some compression here. <clears throat> when you use the latest techniques and PDF supports them, although they don't actually write them in their in Acrobat, but they support, they'll read them and we at C-Vision fully support them at the server class level, you get a much smaller file footprint. Here you see the same image, full color, preserved 111 k bytes. Much more efficient. PDFA is the standard within PDF that's ISO approved, the age for archiving. If you know you want to keep these documents for a long time, you're a government agency, you're the corporate legal department at GE, whatever you are, and you know you need these documents for three years, five years, 37 years, whatever the requirements are. PDFA guarantees they will always open there's nothing left to chance. All the fonts you need are embedded in the document. <clears throat> Hyperlinks to the outside are um, are disallowed. Um, JavaScript that could run and distort the image is not allowed. So, so PDFA is just a safe version. Most PDF documents convert to PDFA in a very seamless transition, and we support that here, C-Vision, PDF Compressor. But PDFA guarantees that they're always archivable from a record management, from an RM perspective, you satisfy the GARP requirement, and the file will be there whenever you need it, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Metadata insertion also, for those of you that are into record management and compliance, metadata insertion is recommended by NARA, for example, because if you want to keep documents in the long term, you may end up having to port from one database to another every three to five years. That's what seems to be the industry norm, because companies get acquired, they merge, they want to merge their IT groups, they want to merge their databases, you're all on FileNet, now you all want to move to something else. Um, it is very helpful to know that the data is self-encapsulated, meaning every document really knows its own author, its own creator, its own um, subject matter. Whatever you want to know about the document, let's say there's 10, 15, 20 fields that are important to you. Aside from putting them into the database, you can put them directly into the file in the metadata insertion. So PDF encourages and NARA supports that is, documents should be self-aware. All the important fields you want to encode about a document, aside from whatever database coding you're doing, can be done directly with metadata insertion, and PDF supports that. Um, another thing is the look and feel of the same. If you get into TIFF and JPEG and other formats, PNG, what have you, uh, there are variations in viewers and variations in what the display is going to look like. Typically, you want to have a uniform experience. Maybe you've got a whole bunch of branch locations. So what you have with Adobe Reader, which has over 600 million seats out there, <clears throat> is that there's a uniform experience in terms of um, what the user sees and feels. So that's very nice, and that's also a PDF feature, which not true for JPEG, not true for, for TIFF. Okay, so we strongly would encourage, if you're headed towards the paperless office, are you taking your document capture seriously? that you consider PDF because we do believe PDF is the best way to handle capture documents. It's not the only way, but we do believe it's head and shoulders the best way. Let's talk a little bit about opportunities for automation. Normally, if you want to sell 
document capture within a company, part of the sell is just, you know, we're going to go painful. So we don't have to keep these shelves, these storages of documents anymore. We can find what we need. We can work in a distributed environment. Everybody, three different offices can be pulling the same document on the same day and sharing it together. So there are obviously advantages, even if you don't automate anything, just for not having the paper around. And a lot of companies are into document capture just for that reason alone. They want to go paper. But what we see, and what we're in the middle of here at T-Vision, is that a lot of companies, once they do that capture, they want to start automating higher level, knowledge-centric processes that come after you've captured. So for example, once you've captured your AP department, you can automate your invoice processing. Understand what's in every invoice automatically. Reconcile it against <clears throat> your AP system and figure out which invoices are good to pay with little or no human effort. Once you've automated the forms part of your business or where the forms are coming in in the mailroom or via fax, you can automatically understand what's in those forms and go to the next step of processing them or talking to your database automatically. Once you've scanned a mailroom, you can route it to people. And it can be action items associated with that routing and it can be done automatically. So there are a lot of higher level functions or processes that you can um, leverage, take advantage of once you have committed to capturing documents within an organization. Okay, and we're saying that here, there are ROI, return on investment opportunities, that are beyond strictly document capture, document optimization. In particular, it can lead to automating certain processes which you're currently, your company, your agency is currently doing manually. You can automatically extract, for example, fields that you're now human coding. You can automatically classify and route things which are being routed manually. These all return a measurable ROI. So for example, we'll list here just based on some of our clients, and you may have use cases of your own. We're going to talk about some use cases of clients that we deal with. <clears throat> We've got hundreds of clients out there, but I'm sure everybody who's listening today has got their own problems and issues, some of which probably can be automated as well. Um, force processing. A lot of you may be getting forms, some are machine, some are handwritten, and you want to data extract from structured or semi-structured documents. That's an automatable process once the document is captured. Invoice processing, you get a lot of invoices, you want to automatically understand each one, learn the vendors, talk to your field system data, automatically approve an invoice is good to pay. Um, that can be automated. In fact, we have a solution here at Fusion for that. Um, document classification, mailroom, you may have a mailroom. And maybe certain things are very high priority. You don't want them to get lost in the shuffle. Theoretically, you hook up an OPEX or an IBML scanner, everything gets scanned, automatically classified, routed to the right group with a priority level, and now things that have to be handled stat right away are handled right away. Nothing gets lost in the shuffle. So these are all opportunities once you've committed to document capture to see a, an ROI by automating processes, document-centric processes that your organization might be doing by hand, manually right now. How do you get started in this <clears throat> business? And let's say some of you listening might already be automating. We just dealt with a company yesterday that has been doing automated redaction for about a year or two and decided they needed a large, much larger volume, but it's working. So you might need to redact sensitive information automatically like social security number or credit card numbers. That can be automated. <clears throat> Maybe you need to highlight certain keywords that you're looking for in a paralegal you know, you're sort of doing legal discovery and you want to help the paralegals out. Um, so all this stuff is, a lot of these things are automatable, but you got to get started somewhere. Is this, you know, the first thing you want to ask yourself is, if I do this, if I push this, if I talk to my boss about it, will it produce an ROI for this company? Will I end up being a champion? Will I get the office award? Or am I going to be in the doghouse if the project goes south for some reason? So, so the first thing we recommend is getting to know your documents. What are you going to have a very effective automated experience with a, with a real strong ROI for your company or not, it depends on your problem and it depends on the documents you have. And we at T-Vision, of course, are always here to help because sometimes you may not have the expertise in-house to understand whether your problem really is amenable to an automated solution or not. Um, but among the things you want to look at is accuracy rate expectations. I mean, what kind of accuracy can we expect from an automated system? How well is those are going to work on my document? Is my handprint, the fields that I'm listing, trying to list off, the codes that I'm trying to, to, to extract on that, are they text, are they printed, <clears throat> are they handwritten? So that's going to make a difference, of course. 
machine print is a lot easier to recognize in general than handwriting. Uh, what is the business process process associated with recognition? That matters too. Some of the business processes, for example, are very high level, and the people you pay to do them are very expensive knowledge workers. Maybe it's K1 automated processing. Maybe it's revenue reconciliation at the tax and accounting level. Um, so some of the things are high level processes. And if you can automate those, uh, there's a greater return on investment than if you're strictly coding uh, zip codes, for example. So understanding the business process and the value associated with automating that process is, of course, one of the variables you need to consider. Another thing is, what kind of duration do you see within the forms? If you want to automate a certain set of documents, how varied are they? Are they, are they what we call fixed ones? Are they semi-structured? Are they unstructured? Now, in each of these cases, there are automation plays that will work. Even in unstructured, based on keywords and other things, you can often get a tremendous return on investment. But they're very different problems from each other, both in how you configure the solution, time to take to put the solution into production, ROI will all vary based on these. So you want to understand, are the forms we have fixed, semi-structured, or unstructured, or maybe some hybrid combination, all of the above. Also, level of variation documents will matter. So if you want to automate your AP department, <clears throat> getting good results, um, to some extent, is the factor of the number of vendors. If you have 100 vendors, you may get good results much quicker because there's a lot of machine learning and understanding your vendors, your EOB payers, or your forms automatically. And the more variation, the longer it takes to learn things that are useful. So if you have 100 vendors, learning those vendors and understanding their invoice structures will take less time than if you have 10,000 vendors. Okay, so level of variation documents will also be another factor. So getting to know your documents and understanding your problem space is probably the most critical factor in understanding whether you can get an ROI from automating some of these business processes. A uh, good way to get started would be what we're calling testing sample documents. So you're looking for a proof of concept. So let's say, you know, if this system works, well, there's 100 people doing this manually, and that would be a big win for your company if those people could be repositioned to do other probably more interesting, less repetitive tasks. But the question is, how do I know it's going to work? Well, what, what companies often do is they'll do a proof of concept on a smaller data set just to be sure that, in principle, um, things work. So this is, we highly recommend that. You come up with a test data set, <clears throat> and you see whether it will work in that limited environment. Um, it's an essential element for implementation, positive implementation of an automated um, document solution. Um, you would first start by getting some sample documents for testing. We recommend there are a lot of typical documents because you don't want to focus on the outliers too much. If 90% of your invoices are well behaved, you want to know that and you want to represent that. If 90% of your forms are well behaved, you want to know that and represent If 90% of your EOBs are well behaved, you want to know that too. So they should hopefully statistically, statistically represent the document mix that you're seeing because you're trying to measure ROI. At the same time, you want to have enough atypical documents out there that you understand the boundary conditions and what happens when we're seeing a really complex document. Does the system break down completely? Can it still handle it? So getting the right sample documents that faithfully replicate what you think the real system will look like when you're in production is a key piece to figuring out whether an automated document processing system can work for you. Um, in addition, if you sit down, and of course, C-Vision would be happy to do this with anybody who wants to explore this, you want to sit down and say, look, what would a solution look like for me? What would the speed, if I put this into production, if I want to make, automate my, my mailroom, what are we talking about? What kind of speed? We have 10,000 emails coming in, mails coming in a day. Can we handle that volume? So at some point, <clears throat> the client needs to sit down with a solutions architect, somebody who's familiar with the nuts and bolts of putting a system together to figure out what is required for automated business process in your company in terms of accuracy, speed, what file formats need to be supported, what degree of automation do you need to achieve ROI. What happens if the form is completely validated with your own business intelligence tool, which are programmable? What do you do? What if a file is partially validated? Do you show it to a human? Do you outsource it? Do you send it to the crowd? So you want to decide, you want to come and sit down with a solutions architect and go through case by case exactly what has to happen in each scenario, right? Maybe you have 10 different kinds of forms, 
and the action items on each form and the business intelligence as to when a form was coded correctly might vary. So we recommend highly you take a sample of documents that's realistic. Okay, you need a realistic document sample. And then you sit down with somebody who's a solutions architect and try to put together a basic proof of concept and see how that works. If you can get a POC working, you are probably halfway, not three quarters of the way there. Sometimes, and not all the time, we have clients come up to us and say, hey, wait a second. I know the form we have right now doesn't scan well or isn't well behaved or it's hard to do handwriting with the form we have. We are willing to redesign that form from the ground up. Sometimes you have that ability. So if you're in control of the entire soup to end, uh, beginning to end, um, uh, all aspects of this problem, you could start with the form itself and control form design. That'll help you on the automation side. So automation, effective automation, begins with effective form design. Uh, for example, you can put in boxes or in combs, which certainly helps for ICR, handwriting recognition, as opposed to if we let you write things unconstrained, your handwriting rates will go down dramatically. Uh, controlling field spacing, so there's no ambiguity, first name, last name, source number. Controlling field spacing also can help with recognition. If you separate things out, so for example, the phone number, we put some spaces between the different fields or subfields on a phone number that we can disambiguate exactly what each piece of phone number looks like. If we know it's a numbers field, we have it delineated a certain way. Color can also improve uh, your race because that allows you to do color capture and then cleanly separate the form from the data. One of the reasons sometimes you lose accuracy or automation in this business, you get some mix, <clears throat> some collusion between the form and the data. We'd really rather want to keep them separate. You subtract the form, but you use the form to tell you exactly where you are positionally with respect to the data element, but that way the data element and the form are completely distinct from each other in the color space. So that's another way to improve rate is design the form in a certain color, knowing that people will fill it out in a different color. Let's say the form uh, is in a light red, and you figure people will be using blue or blue-black ink, and that will delineate the form from the data cleanly. So let's talk about forms processing application. For example, we can see some of the verticals where we have clients that have successful, successfully deployed automated solutions in various verticals that include healthcare, tax and accounting, finance and banking, government, insurance, corporate. These are all verticals where we have seen companies with very, very effective automated solutions that either we've been involved with or not. They've automated um, document-centric processes by putting an automation component into the system. It starts by capturing your, your uh, files unless they're already electronic, but then automatically understanding them, and maybe even auto-validating that they're correct. We recommend auto-validation as a way to determine that everything extracted from a form is correct. And maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But essentially, auto-validation is, for every kind of form normally, there are things you check for to be sure that you've extracted all the information correctly. Talk about an invoice, right? If everything checks sums on an invoice and everything adds up to the total, Every product line is correct. You're pretty sure you've got it correct. That's what you'd ask sort of a human to check for. In the healthcare space, the same thing with an EOB, all the procedures have to total out. So there are things you look for, check some rules, business intelligence rules, to let you validate that every form is correct. So these are verticals where we've seen companies deploy very effective automated forms processing solutions. When you do that, what do you expect? Well, you should reduce your cost, reduce your manpower effort. But also accelerate the business process. I mean, maybe it takes you five days to clear an invoice, and now it's an automated system. It should happen in half a day. Talk a little bit about forms processing with respect to machine print and handwriting. Um, handwriting is a bit of a challenge. I would say it's still on the research cusp of what we can do. It doesn't mean because you have a handwriting problem we can't solve it. It only means it's tricky and don't assume it can be solved. Um, recognizing handwriting usually requires out-of-the-box engineering, so there's a lot you can do with handwriting if you know your problem space. Professional services can put in some rules that will help you recognize things. If we know it's a social security number, we're going to put in rules that really try to solve for social security number. If we know it's a zip code, if we know this is an address block, and the zip code matches the, uh, and the city and the street name all have to be found somewhere on a map of the U.S., 
we uh, use a Google map and we in real time dynamically check against that map. So a lot of things we can do for higher rates if the problem has some constraints on it. And most problems have some constraints on it. Um, if you know that a field is numbers versus letters, you can configure for that. You can be sure that image preprocessing removes whatever forms information is getting in the way of recognition. Um, if it's a numerated field like a zip code, you're going to do much better. If it's a dollar map, you're going you're to do much better. So foreign processing is an art and a science, and every application is a little bit different. If you want to go down that route, we're always here if you have any questions. A lot of foreign processing problems are automatable, even if they involve significant handwriting. I wouldn't rule it out. Anything that's machine print can be solved. But even handwriting, if it's engineered the right way, configured the right way, a lot of these problems are solvable. Let's talk about, a little bit about document classification, um, which really creates a portal to your business. And another way of viewing this really, the classification engine is really something which a lot of companies might use in a mailroom situation for mailroom automation. For example, let's say you're the mailroom of an AP department and you want to sort out things coming in, right? It's invoices, it's credit memos, it's POs. That would start the mailroom with a classifier that knows what the document types are. Let's talk about a legal mailroom. You want to know what kind of matter this is, how urgent it is, what court it's going to. There again, a mailroom automation work. Let's say that you're a uh, publicly traded um, tax department and uh, you need to know you're handling tax matters in a BPO environment for different clients. You need to understand which client it relates to and its urgency. So a mailroom automation scenario is a place where you can see very clear ROI. You start by classifying the documents coming in, understanding where they go. Oh, yeah, this account's payable. That's just the finance. That's just engineering. And you can put a priority in each one. This is not urgent. This one is really urgent. You've got to look at it today. So classification, of course, is the art and science of understanding what this document relates to. You might want to know, for example, if you're a bank, that this file that came in is a mortgage document. Maybe not more than that. The mortgage document has the homework. It's a mortgage document. It's a car loan. It's a used car loan. Okay. So a classifier is typically used, not only, not exclusively, in a mailroom or capture environment to figure out what does this document relate to, what are the next action items related to this document. So for example, if you had in your mailroom a mailroom automation piece that would classify all the documents and say, this is an AP document, you could then route it, at least in theory, to an AP automation piece of software which would take the invoice, read off what's ever on there, and then convey that information to your AP system, say it's good to pay. Good example, this is taken from one of our clients. Uh, typically, uh, before they start, it's all in, it's a manual business, this one company had three people that were full-time coding uh, what came in in the invoices. They did about, <clears throat> I think they did um, maybe three to 500 invoices a day would be their peak processing uh, rate. Um, it translated into, I think, about 30 invoices per person per hour. They put an automated solution in. All of a sudden, they only needed one person doing coding in the mailroom. Two were repositioned to uh, handle other tasks. I think still in maybe APAR. Uh, the volume per person increased tremendously. <clears throat> this is with our Trapeze invoice automation product. But by notion, they weren't even capturing the documents when they started. So by capturing their paper, going paperless, and then putting it through an AP automation tool, in this case it happened to be our software, Stevens and Trapeze software, they were able to go through productivity rate of 100 invoices per hour um, in the AP department and cut down their uh, resources for three people full-time to one person. And in addition, they actually went up because when you automate, you can set any business intelligence rules you want. And they and all of a sudden were able to say, look, if it doesn't reconcile completely with the PO system data, reject it. So in, not only did they speed it up and lower their manpower requirements, in addition, the accuracy rates um, went up from 97% to 99%. So let's go through. I just want to give you a feeling again. I think we're, 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 we're getting close to the end of the talk. So I want to, those of you that are interested and have questions, I want you to stick around because we definitely want to hear from you and see if there's anything we can be helpful with to uh, you guys uh, today. So we'll take some questions and answers at the end. Here's one cli client case study. 
was a U.S. company that had labor-intensive AP department doing invoices by hand. They wanted to automate it. They weren't even scanning them initially. So it starts, of course, by casting the documents. They had a bunch of full-time employees uh, keying in the information, the invoices, matching it against things in their PS system. Um, it was a full-time job for several of the employees that could use them anywhere else. And um, it also was a delay. Sometimes it would take two or three days, even sometimes a week, from what they were telling us to code an invoice into the system. People were on vacation, so you didn't always have that consistent turnaround time they would have liked. Solution for them, in this case, involved licensing division strategies product for invoice processing, one of the verticals that handled automated this process, basically. It classifies each invoice automatically by vendor, learns the vendors automatically through machine learning, and through auto templating, learns where each field is and the table structure. So using this product, they were automatically able to identify, classify, and extract all the line items, all the data, including line item data, from the invoices that they needed to. Some of the benefits, employees can now process invoices in an hour instead of taking a whole day. Uh, additional time to focus on more value-added tasks. Uh, they didn't have to pick up additional employees. And they saw an ROI on, on, the, uh, on the software in just six months. So it was a quick ROI turnaround time. It's another client case study. This case was an international accounting firm, one of the top uh, four, big company, that um, Want to do the following? They wanted to basically um, go through um, complex tax forms, understand everything that was in them, including some stuff which was more um, varied, um, the supplemental aspects to it. Put everything in a very clean Excel form that could be tabulated automatically. So they're going through complex tax forms with rules, understanding what's in them, and mapping them into an Excel. It would allow them to distinguish. This firm would allow it to distinguish themselves from the competition because they, they had a bot, they had an automated solution to do things that the competitors were doing by hand. Um, it made them allow the service in a more price competitive way and gave them a much faster turnaround time. So again, the solution here for this client was, starts by capturing all their data, but also by licensing division to piece software would let them automate this part of their business. They were able to process signs up to 10 million pages a year it was fairly specialized. They needed tax professionals. During this three or four month window, they needed to train people in the art of understanding these tax forms and mapping to Excel. This was now done automatically. All documents were made fully text searchable, instant retrieval, even competitive advantage against their competition, faster turnaround time for their clients. They built an expert system that can handle this kind of volume. They could just spin up another 20 servers in the cloud, didn't have to train another 100 people. So you had an, an expert system which can ramp up and ramp down depending on the season and depending on the demand. In this case, the firm realized an ROI within four months. So this is another example of automating a business process and seeing effective ROI in just a few months. Then we got one more for you. Um, in this case, we're talking about a global financial that had a lot of physical documents they were accumulating and they needed to start going paperless and processing things automatically. So they were worried about the storage and personnel costs and also um, inability to differentiate certain documents. In this case, they were handling this company. Um, <clears throat> the tax levied on properties for a lot of the energy energy companies. And um, sometimes there were huge penalties if things weren't processed um, in a matter of days. So imagine that you're seeing 10,000 pieces of mail a day or a week. And a lot of them are, are garbage or can be handled slowly. But 1%, 2%, 5% of those have to be handled extremely high priority. Or you could have a million dollar penalty because you didn't pay the tax on this nuclear reactor. So some of these were very high priority. They wanted everything captured, first of all. So they went paperless. Then we could automatically, and we did, set up a mailroom automation environment for them where you're prioritizing all these documents and you know what's urgent and what's not. And then you're routing it to the right division within the company. So some of the benefits once this system was put into full production, which was a few years ago, about two years ago, I guess, a year and a half ago, costs dramatically dropped because you automatically classify, route, and sort the files. You avoid late fees and penalties. Now instead of paper, you have compressed PDF that can be sent to the right analyst or wherever they need to be sent within the organization to process them. 
in this case, for this digital Merrim automated solution, this Merrim automation solution, ROI was approximately the same. So in conclusion, um, when you talk about document capture, it's, it's not the whole it's not the whole puzzle that you want to put together for your company. You're looking to automate. Let's say you want to capture your paper because you want less of a paper trail. That's true. But typically, when you look at why you're capturing paper, there are very serious cost savings and benefits by automating the processes that come after document capture. What else do you want to do with this form, with this AP, with this healthcare document, with this EOB, with this loan application? Normally, within an organization, this document has a purpose. Maybe you just want to archive, and that's the end of the story. But very often, there are things, higher level processes that have to happen to this document. A lot of that, and that's the takeaway from this, hopefully from today's um, lecture, is that there is a strong automation play and a strong ROI if you think about the, the processes that happen to a document after it's captured. Typically, when we've seen processes that have been automated from the mailroom, the form processing, AP automation, we're talking about labor reduction of 50 to 80 percent. Data accuracy goes up, not down, because effectively you're almost double king. You have an OCR process as your first key, strong business intelligence, and anything that doesn't auto validate is sent to a human. So essentially, there are two people. There's a machine, and then a human checking correctness. So it's really like a two-key process, and data accuracy normally would increase, not decrease. In addition, you're accelerating your your um, your churn rate, your process time. Is, um, is going down, you're accelerating your process through automatic classification indexing. If you have a file, a type priority, you're never going to know about it right away. If there's somebody that needs to see something stat, you will send it stat. So it really lets you prioritize all your documents right away. It lets you automate solutions, which typically would be done by hand within an, within an industry, and lets you automate things like invoices, your AP department, EOB, explanation of benefits, if you're in healthcare corporate forms. A lot of the documents where you're talking about classification, routing, data extraction, can all be automated. So if you're thinking about going paperless, or if you're already scanning some of your documents, you should think about, can I really automate the larger process? We're part of a mailroom, can I automate the mailroom? Part of an AP department, can I automate that? So the answer is, in a lot of cases, not always, you can automate fully or partially. Um, document-centric process, as long as you can identify them, understand what has to be solved. And maybe, we see this a lot, the larger problem, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? So the larger problem, you may not automate overnight. That might be a two-year job. But maybe there's a first place to start. You get a lot, a lot of these kinds of documents with an extremely, you need to turn them over right away. Uh, very high priority, mortgage application. So maybe you want to start often with one class of documents, and if that's a win, then you can move towards automating additional document-centric processes within your organization. Uh, normally with these systems, because you're replacing manual effort, it's easy to demonstrate the ROI of an automated system once it's in production. So again, we appreciate your time today. And um, it was a pleasure uh, talking with you. We'd love to hear from you guys. Or Chris, Adam, any questions that, that um, our audience might have? Um, well. Yes, that's the, there are some already that's come in, but first I want to say thank you so much. This was definitely very informative indeed. Um, the first question that came in, Ari, is uh, what are the accuracy, accuracy rates for ICR? Adam, thank you for that question. So the answer is they vary heavily. We typically see in the lab, empirically, that you're getting about 97%, 98%, but that's per character. So what you've got to figure is if it's a zip code, you probably get the zip code right 90% of the time on the five digits. Um, if it's an address, probably 80 plus percentage because there's a way to check that, make sure that the zip code and the street name all match out. If it's just generic, if it's someone's name or something you can't validate, it's going to be a little bit lower than that. So it's really going to vary. You're going to do better for numeric than for alpha. So if the more numeric it is, the more reliable it is. And also, if you know that it's an address, you know it's a first name, last name, you can check it against dictionaries. I would say normally our OCR accuracy rates we give is about 99% per character. ICR is a little bit less. It's more like, again, 96% per character. Thank you, Ari. That was the first of several that have come in. Um, the next question is, 
does this software integrate with EMC Captiva? Um, yes, actually it integrates very nicely. So nicely that EMC has been reselling our software for several years along with uh, Aya Captiva. So if anybody wants to um, to take a PDF uh, to PDF compressor or trapeze automation solution and bundle that with Captiva, they, they certainly can do so. We're sold we sell directly, but in, but in addition, EMC as a partner sells um, C-Vision through their select program, and what we make integrates directly with as a component in the IA Captiva workflow. So yes, we do integrate. Excellent. The next question that's come in is, can this software work with SharePoint? <clears throat> uh, we definitely work with SharePoint. We love SharePoint. We don't know if SharePoint loves us, but we definitely love SharePoint. In our uh, e-file, one of our trapeze lines, we integrate and uh, classify directly into SharePoint. We can understand within a SharePoint repository, we can classify documents coming in to a flat folder or a Windows-based structure and put them directly where they're supposed to be put in SharePoint. So we're interoperable with SharePoint. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, Ari, is do you have an API available? We have. Thanks for asking that, Adam. Um, we have an API because some of our clients, I would say maybe 90% of our users are using our end user product. Right? Chris is sort of nodding. Good. But we have some that are making a solution of their own. Uh, and maybe our relationship is an OEM relationship. Or we have companies that want to use us, but they want us to fit. They're using us for an in-house product. Um, like a financial company or a bank, but they want us to fit inside a product they already have. So certainly a reasonable part of our client base, probably 10%, um, they take our API toolkit and they integrate it. We have drivers and we also have people here to help you make sure your driver code runs correctly. So certainly you can use us directly, the end user level, you use us through watch folder, web service call. You can also use us by embedding our API into into your software in a sort of an OEM relationship. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next qu question that's come in, Ari, is what are the modes available to process documents using this technology? What can, can you just read that back to me again? What other modes are available? Uh, yes. What are the modes available to process documents using this technology. Right. So there's a lot of ways to talk to our trapeze automation solution system and our PDF compressor uh, PDF conversion system. Typically a lot of clients will use Watch Folder because they have folders and they're also known as hot folders and all the active matter is put into those folders from which um, our system would pick it up, process it, and drop it whatever output folders or SharePoint and structure uh, they want to drop into. So watch folders is one mechanism. Um, web service calls is another pretty standard way to do it. There's job ticket, uh, and there's API calls. Uh, there's also batch conversion from a directory or recursive set of directories. So these are all ways that one can operate, um, uh, communicate with our trapeze automation system. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question has come in is, what DPI do you recommend to scan to? And uh, it's D's and dog, P's and pirate, and I's and Ida, just in case you couldn't hear from my accent. We normally recommend uh, 300 DPI. For black and white, we would certainly recommend uh, 300 DPI. Uh, because what we found, if you go less than that, letters get stuck together, OCR rates go down, and since we use JBIG2, uh, which is the, the super compression technology that we've sort of been on a on a leading leading edge of, so within JBIG2 you actually get the lowest rates under 300 because you get clean scans, letters don't get stuck. At 200, um, it's not a win because again, the S gets stuck to the T, the U gets stuck to the E. You're actually paying for more components, compression size goes up, the clarity goes down, the OCR rates, recognition rates goes down. Now for for color, you don't strictly need 300 DPI. We'd still recommend it, but if you even use 150 or 200, but you keep your quantization level above 90, that's your color quantization quality under JPEG, uh, you should still be fine. So we would say 
300 for black and white for sure, 300 for color and grayscale recommended, but if you, for example, capture 200 in, in those spaces, you could still be fine provided that the quality of the color grayscale scan is kept high. For that we mean 90% or higher in terms of uh, JPEG quality. All right, thank you. And the last question that has come in is, what file formats can the software accept as input? Thank you, Adam. So, so we really accept uh, PDF, for example, all image formats, you know, your PNGs, your GIFs, your JPEG, your TIFF, your PDF that are captured as image. So all of those. Um, and then in our next release, we hope to accept uh, all Microsoft generated electronic formats. We don't we don't currently accept that. You have to convert it first. So the short answer would be all image formats, pretty much, and PDF. All right. Well, thank you, Ari, uh, again for your time. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. This concludes today's broadcast. You will be able to access the recorded version from this web webinar from our archive section at www.dclab.com. Our next webinar will be next Wednesday, July 16th at 1 p.m., titled Using Digital in the K-12 Classroom, being presented by Mercy Pilkerton, Senior Editor at Good Eve Reader and CEO of Author Options. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys.